coming up, fitting an oil catch can to your car. Where does this sit exactly on the landscape of good ideas and bad ideas? I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Aussie new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. Now, if there's one thing males do more fantasizing about than oil catch cans, I am yet to discover it. Sorry to disappoint, ladies. All over the world, you know, men folk are invoking incognito windows and scouring the internet for oil catch can porn. It's so uplifting down there. I'm seeing a lot of videos out there that discuss dirty valves due to direct injection. Lots of guys are using catch cans, but do I need to worry about the future health of my valves with a naturally aspirated engine if I don't install a catch can? Am I worrying needlessly? The better to understand this filthy oil catch can porn fixation and to decide whether to join the oil catch can porn boy band for yourself, you've really got to understand three key systems and how they interact in your engine. Imagine, for a moment, the worst storm you have ever been in. Zero visibility, driving rain, fog, a Force 15 gale. It's as black as the inside of the rectory at the Lover's Lane Baptist Church in West Analsex at midnight. Only it's hot. It's hell hot. This is, of course, what it's like inside the crankcase of even a mediocre four-cylinder engine operating at just a few thousand RPMs. Thunder, lightning, 100 combustion events every second upstairs. There's more sucking, squeezing, banging, blowing, rubbing and squirting than the Stormy Daniels pre-presidential workout plan. And I have watched that several times because I love internal combustion. Just saying. Piston rings, for example, they are so versatile, but they do not seal completely. So some combustion byproducts inevitably blow by the rings and into the crankcase. So if the crankcase were hermetically sealed, then this would be quite bad because it would quickly become pressurized down there. And then it would pump oil out past the front and rear main bearing seals. And then you would inevitably blow a seal, which is messy and guaranteed to get you evicted forcefully from the zoo that fateful afternoon. Afterwards, your engine would make a rather loud noise and compose, and compose <laughs> a letter to its barrister alleging assault. And that's bad. It would make an application for damages too. So in practice, they vent the crankcase by way of a so-called breather, they, whoever they are, used to vent those vapours to the atmosphere, but that's not the most environmentally defensible option. So now they feed those oily vapours down the engine's neck and they purify it in hellfire. Yes. Or at least they run it through the combustion chamber. Same sort of thing. It's a good idea in principle, with the one downside being the potential coating of the inlet plumbing's guts with an oily residue of formerly aerosolised oil, fuel, water and sundry scungy crap for the crankcase. On its own, this is not a disaster. I mean, a well-designed engine has an oil separator built into the crankcase ventilation system. It can suck that stuff in all day long if necessary. <laughs> I know, it does seem somewhat intuitively spasticated to feed spent exhaust gas back into your engine. But pollution is kind of a big deal, and if you don't believe that, you're insane. Road trauma gets the spotlight, that's for sure, but in fact, exhaust emissions from road transport kill more people prematurely than car crashes. This is just a fact, so get over it. Facts do not care how you feel about them. This fact is why emissions control laws are so fundamentally necessary and important to the consternation of German monkey spankers everywhere. 
pumping spent exhaust gas back through your engine is mainly an engineering solution to eliminate oxides of nitrogen or NOx. These are the class of chemicals that mean monkey spanking Rupert Stadler wakes up each morning singing, I fought the law and the law won. At least that's what I heard. NOx, okay, it only forms at high temperatures and pressures, so pumping in some fairly inert exhaust gas at low engine loads prevents that from happening. So that's good. If it is designed well, EGR also makes your engine more efficient. It prevents temperature spikes during the combustion event, and that means that less heat will be rejected into the metal of your engine, meaning more energy remains available to work on the piston, thrusting it down towards the storm down there. And that's good. EGR also reduces throttling losses in petrol engines because you have to open the throttle a little bit more to produce the same power output when EGR is operating. This is kind of like drinking a slushy through a thicker straw. It's just easier. Ultimately, on gasoline engines, 5 to 15% of exhaust gas is recirculated, but as much as 50% is EGR'd in diesels. This is because of the inherently different flame front type combustion demands between diesels and petrols. Petrols demand a continuous flame front, otherwise they will misfire or incompletely burn. Hands up if you knew that. Diesel is not constrained in exactly the same way. EGR does not function at idle or at big power outputs. It just happens when the engine is loping along on the freeway or in flowing city traffic. They turn it off at idle to make the engine smoother and at big outputs, obviously, you need to jam in as much fresh air as you can to burn the maximum possible amount of fuel and make the most power. The downside with EGR is that now you've got hot exhaust with carbon particles in it added to oily crankcase vapour. Yes! Which, if it's not managed properly, is unfortunately the ideal recipe for creating tarry sludge. The engine plumbing equivalent of cholesterol. Atherosclerosis. Here we come. That's bad. Direct injection was a huge step forward for combustion control, and that means it saves you money whenever the engine is turning and burning. It's better for both efficiency and emissions, so that's good. The negative feedback effect is that the injectors are no longer located in the inlet port, spraying a powerful solvent onto the inlet valves more or less continuously. And this accounts for the carbonisation phenomenon you read about all the time relating to direct injection if you are one of those oil catch can porn downloaders. In fact, it's kind of overly simplistic to say direct injection causes this. It's down to feedback effects of EGR and crankcase ventilation plus direct injection, particularly when they malfunction. Direct injection just ensures that the inlet valves do not swim in fuel continuously and are thus unwashed now and subject to the same contamination from tarry sludge as the rest of the inlet tract. The somewhat demanding job engineers have in R&D is to ensure the feedback effects of the systems they design do not rise up in rebellion and open the book of revelation at the feet of car owners everywhere. There are plenty of examples of when this happens, right? When they go to war too zealously on internal friction, engines start to drink a lot more oil. And we do see that rather a lot these days. So it's the job of the R&D nerd with his propeller cap on every day to stop too much aerosolized oil from entering the inlet plumbing. They put oil separators in the system at the factory specifically for that. They're little mesh filters designed to pull sufficient suspended oil particles out of the flow before it gets to the inlet plumbing. They also need to keep carbon particles in the exhaust under control to prevent the EGR from over-enthusiastically producing that tarry sludge, which creates all those problems. 
A modern engine is a complex system. Complexity is the enemy of reliability inherently, and R&D is the only antidote to this problem. One day, I sincerely hope Volkswagen, Fiat Chrysler and Daimler come to understand the nature of this beast. So, if a turbo engine develops a crack in the inlet air plumbing after the math sensor, then the engine will overfuel continuously. It will therefore overproduce soot. This could easily clog the inlet plumbing, but it's not the GDI, the PCV or the EGR that are actually causing that. It's either a one-off problem or bad R&D. The blockage in the example I just referenced is a symptom of the disease, which is a defect in the inlet air plumbing, rather than being the disease itself. You know, the way you tell this is if you clean it out without rectifying the underlying disease, the blockage is just going to return. Engineers can successfully prevent all of these defects, obviously, because there is no pandemic of new cars failing in service, having a stroke at the roadside at five years of age or something. But often the R&D is underdone and problems do come to the fore. And sometimes it is you who is responsible because owners of vehicles also push the boundaries. So let's talk about that. The worst thing you can do to your car, one of them at least, short of parking in the ocean or on the streets of Fallujah with an I Heart New York bumper sticker, is a series of never-ending short trips in the city with lots of cold starts. So much blow-by, suboptimal expansion of the parts in your engine, low temperatures in the oil, lots of oil dilution and major contamination. Then, let's say you can go a month or maybe three over on the servicing. And you might rationalise this to yourself by saying, the service schedule says 12 months and 15,000 Ks, but OK, it's 12 months, but I've only done 10,000. I'll wait. People do this all the time, right? And they should not. You are creating hell on earth for your engine oil if you do. And there are no symptoms but that doesn't mean this is not a very bad idea. If you do predominantly short trips, you are exactly the person the time-based service interval was invented for. It's whichever comes first, the time or the distance. And maybe, just maybe, you've got a clogged air filter as well, and that makes the inlet system suck all the harder, more enthusiastically extracting crankcase vapor than otherwise. Maybe you have re-chipped the engine based on the claims of some aftermarket genie ass who said he was unleashing the latent power down there, which the factory was too stupid to access in development. So your vehicle might actually go a little bit better now, but it overfuels a lot, perhaps, because the guy who designed the allegedly superior fuel map only really knew enough to be truly dangerous. Personally, I think a lot of this carbonisation drama would just go away if people left their vehicles standard, if they went for regular drives on the highway, and if they got their damn vehicles serviced on time. So there's that. Fitting a catch can is, of course, up to you, the individual pornographer. I note that the people doing the recommending of catch cans are generally the ones selling them. So explain to me how that's not a commercial conflict of interest, worst case scenario, or at least an example of extreme bias. Certainly there are a great many videos online allegedly demonstrating exactly how much liquid can be collected when you install a catch can. Of course, this is not the same thing as solving the carbonisation problem if, in fact, there is one. There's not too much or indeed any robustly scientific back-to-back -back controlled testing of, for example, two identical cars doing identical driving on exactly the same fuel for an extended period, followed by a robust teardown and assessment of the parts. Or if there is, I haven't seen that. Because 
I presume that would be a bit too hard for amateur hour. There's just a lot of videos depicting the draining of catch cans and demonstrating how much liquid was collected. And most of that is, pretty clearly, just oil that would have flowed through the engine and been burned away in exactly the manner the designers intended. Essentially, what they're doing is saying, here's this oil we caught, which the engine was capable of burning asymptomatically for eternity. This is not the same thing as averting some carbonisation disaster. Because why let the truth get in the way? And of course, the owners of those catch cans, well, they want to validate their decision to fit the damn things in the first place, which is textbook confirmation bias. If you decide to go for the full X rating and strap on a catch can to your engine, my advice is get a reputable one with baffles and a proper oil separating system inside, not just some empty aluminium box, and have it fitted by a reputable professional with appropriate product liability insurance. Let's not forget that you are bolting this thing to the most expensive component on your car, the engine, the replacement cost of which will be absolutely horrendous if there is a problem. Someone has to carry the liability for this modification and it might as well not be you. If you're enthusiastically downloading oil catch can porn right now, Remember that the number of recommendations online is actually quite small in relation to the number of GDI, EGR and PCV equipped engines in service around the world today. There is actually no pandemic of carbonised inlet tracts to cure. I'm John Cadogan. and I hope this helps. If you have fitted a catch can to your fine vehicle, let me know your experience of it in the comments feed below. And remember, you matter, unless you multiply yourself by the speed of light squared. In that case, you energy, an important distinction, and you heard it here first in Applied Physics 101. Yes. Thanks for watching.